Hi, welcome to this introduction lecture for, boom, Multicultural Children's Literature. You might have already seen this in my quick intro, but I love this quote, just love it. I think it really works well for this class. So we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about all sorts of children's literature in this class, right? And you will be surprised at the messages that are in very many of them. Some of them fabulous, positive, uplifting, inclusive messages. Some of them kind of tongue in cheek like this one, click, clack, moo, cows that type. And then others that are really still continuing to be a damaging sort of stereotype uh, that we perpetuate in so many of our uh, children's books, which we'll talk about quite a bit this, this semester. But this particular book is kind of cool in, in that it's all about anarchy. It's about um, sh going on strike and shutting down the barn because the farmer does not want to give the cows a typewriter. So it's a cute book, but some really strong messages in there as well, which you don't necessarily have to deconstruct when you're working with children. But some of the messages are a little more obvious, and we will talk about those obvious messages in children's books as well. So. I'm crazy about books. I'm crazy about children's books. And I want to tell you some amazing things in this intro. It's more amazing than that total eclipse of the sun. What it was now several years ago. But I love this photo of my daughter Zoe looking up into that eclipse with her safety glasses on. But here's the deal. Harry Potter saved my life. Well, not my life, but other lives. So we just set aside... Uh, the author of the Harry Potter books, J.K. Rowling's sort of really interesting take or her um, really sort of biased look at transgenderism. Set that aside for a second because I want to tell you about a little bit of research. So uh, a, a really major um, entity, the Journal of Applied Social Psychology, uh, did a study, uh, now it's been a couple, uh, several years, 2014, where they they looked at um, at all of J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series and uh, determined that if people read those, kids, adults, read those, those that series, that they, it statistically, authentically, empirically, whateverly reduced their prejudices towards minority groups. So that's kind of amazing when you think that you can take a children's book, because this still is a children's book, right? It's a chapter book, but it's considered children's literature. You can take something like a series, uh, a really entertaining uh, storyline, and you can reduce um, uh, prejudices towards uh, non-dominant culture entities, is really how I put it. So wouldn't that have been great way back in Charlottesville, right? If some of these chaps had read Harry Potter. Maybe you'd need to have more than just one, set one, two, three, four, six books to really get the message across for some of them. Would have been helpful here too, right? Would have been helpful here. Probably need a little bit more. Storming of the Capitol. Ooh, I wonder how many of those chaps read the Harry Potter series. Right. And, you know, I, I, it's I'm it's I'm a little tongue in cheek, but I'm not all the way, because the deal is that what we're going to talk about a lot in this class is the idea of children's books being a perfect platform for social justice issues, for issues of of um, racism and sexism and homophobia and ableism and and xenophobia. And gosh, there's just so many. Right. Colorism. There's just so many, so many. So we're going to talk about that a lot. And so the deal is that I think that good books, diverse books, authentic multicultural children's books can really help help shift um, our perspectives. And we're going to talk about that. So, so this book is hopefully out of libraries, right? It's gone. It's gone. It's quaint. It's awful. And it should be gone, right? And you would think this book would be gone, and it's kind of, kind of gone, but it's still around because it's been in print. It continues to be in print, and a lot of times, if you go into uh, children's libraries 
you'll see, and even on this campus, there's some pretty awful books in there, right? So an interesting thing, the Council on Interracial Books for Children found that children are repeatedly exposed to racist and sexist and all the other ists too, the ableist, um, uh, misogynist, I mean, all, all, the, all the other ones, you will name them, right? So they're exposed to all of these, these negative stereotypes. And at some point, they see it so often that they just figure it's the real deal. It's true. So they accept the stereotypes as reality. And a big push of where they get a lot of their messages, it's, it's through media, but for, you know, all sorts of media, 2D and stuff, but kids are still really drawn to books. So the idea that stereotypes are accepted as reality because we keep pushing those stereotypes is a very, um, I'm going to be hyperbolic here to say it's a, I think it's a pretty horrific thing. I think it's pretty awful. Right? So what's that connection? We have a million books about um, objectifying girls, right? About that they need to look pretty and they need to be princesses. They need to be all the stuff in order to be um, powerful or accepted or part of the crowd, right? So they're just all over the place. Princess Barbie Charm School. My little beauty shop, the makeup I love. Hello. Today I'll be a princess. What's the connection? Look at this one. So Scholastics, a fabulous, fabulous book company that puts out really inexpensive books. They're in, in all the Scholastic uh, book fairs at elementary school. So really great ex access to books. Look at this. Red Riding Hood gets lost. Look who's the wolf. What's the connection there? I think there's something there. I think it's something that we need to really dig into about objectifying girls and females and the ramifications of all of that, right? Yeah, yeah. So this book, The Five Chinese Brothers. Once upon a time, there were five Chinese brothers and they all looked exactly alike. Now you think this is out of print, right? It was um, 1955, I think, when it first came out. What a way to perpetuate stereotypes. And guess what? It's not out of print. So that means it's in the hands of children and it's in the hands of teachers who still use it. What's the connection? It's their representation, perpetuating stereotypes. It's not 2000 and late. It's 2023. I is for Indian. Let's play Indian. Let's dress like your basic generic Indian. Love this from Martin Luther King, right? Our nation was born in genocide when it embraced the doctrine that the original American, the Indian, was an inferior race. So you ask, what's the, the, the connection, right? What's the connection? But we're also going to be asking, what's the question? So the question that we talk about a lot in this here class is how can we help counter, right now, sexist and racist messages? Sorry about that. People are wanting to email me. We need to change the message, right? We got to change the message. Here is a quote that I love to bits, and I'm going to be... It's in every lecture practically, right? Quality multicultural, let me start over. Quality multi, multicultural literature provides an opportunity for all children to see themselves in books, foster, fosters a positive self-esteem, and cultivates respect, empathy, and acceptance of people. Whew, couldn't get that out very well, right? It's a mouthful, but oh my gosh, does it pack a punch? We're just saying, get us some good books, get kids some good children's books, and dang. Let's see if I can do it better this time. Quality multicultural literature provides an opportunity for all children to see themselves in books, fosters a positive self-esteem, and cultivates respect, empathy, and acceptance of people. Big 
big stuff in our little divided world, right? In our divided society right here in the good old U.S. of A. So we've got some things to talk about, and I'm going to tell you why I think it's so important that every citizen in the U.S. of A. and in the world is represented, is reflected in their culture. Okay, so there's all sorts of definitions for multicultural children's literature, and I'm going to just kind of give you the one that we're using, but, you know, I always go down a windy road to get there. So, come along! So, this was like, when I was growing up, this was the, the def, kind of the idea and definition of multicultural children's literature. You're going to focus on diverse cultures from around the world and, and kind of focus more on linguist, linguistic differences, religious groups, you know, just kind of Kind of that, some cult, some ethnic groups. So, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if that's your definition, but that's what I grew up with. And so that's what I have in my head. But um, in this class, we're going to do all that. But what we also want to focus on and remember that we're looking at multicultural children's literature and, and it's defined this way. is It's uh, literature about racial, ethnic, and identity minority groups that are culturally and socially different from the Anglo-Saxon majority of the United States, whose large and middle class values and customs are most represented in America, American literature. So basically what we're looking at is we're looking at literature that isn't just centered on whiteness, really, is what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's everything but that. And, and it's also not centered on uh, our dominant, dominant culture, which is white and male. So, so females uh, 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 white females get kind of thrown into this whole mix of multicultural children's literature in that we're looking at everything that moves away from the dominant culture. Dead white presidents? Well, well, that's how I'm reflecting it, right? I'm reflecting that way because in North America, our dominant culture is this. It's, it's this who kind of has been the makers and, you know, shakers and movers and whatever of our society right you know from 17 well even before 1776 right 1691 i mean it just goes on and on right so it's just that uh, the dominant culture is white male able-bodied heterosexual christian um pretty youthful access to stuff right access to getting money and making money and doing all of that so if we're looking at multicultural literature from what I consider a basic, basic premise is that we're looking at literature outside of this dominant culture that I just kind of defined. And you might ask, so oh, really? You're really going to go down this road for kids' books? But the deal is, I am going down this road. Because this is, I, this is, it's, it gets crazy every year in terms of how much I believe that, that look at this quote, information provided by literature helps young people learn about people, other people, other places, other sides of the world, or even down the street. They learn about something other than themselves, which means, oh, here we go, that it provides them perspective. It pro provides them um, generosity and um, um embracing and excitement about other people besides themselves so what the deal is that if we just only have one one show one like ideal then everybody that doesn't match that ideal falls to the wayside right and that's we see that in everything we see that in in just power dynamics we see it in what who's reflecting the oscars or the golden gloves that just was happened or who like who gets to run for president i mean all that stuff we're seeing all of that so so then in effect you could say that if we only look at some of the typical books or we always are falling back to to kind of dominant culture uh voices then what we're doing is we're, we're reinforcing just one story. And we're going to be talking about that, the danger of a single story and the danger of not reflecting and representing all of our, our citizens, right? And so when we're looking at that dominant group, there's so many people that don't fall within that dominant culture group, right? Even me, because I'm old, I'm white, I'm uh, a queer. So there, I get three of them, but that, but of color trumps me every time, right? So what we're saying is that if you're not part of the dominant culture, 
then you're othered, you're marginalized, you're less than. And that's what we want to talk about in this class. So I just love this quote. I'm just going to read it. When those who have the power to name and to socially construct reality, meaning what's the ideal, what's the ideal of everything, beauty, you know, power, uh, whatever it should be. So construct reality and they choose not to see you or hear you, whether you're dark skinned, old, disabled, female, or speak with a different accent or dialect than theirs. When someone with the authority of, say a teacher, describes the world and you are not in it, there's a moment of psychic disequilibrium, as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. So many, so many, so many, so many students can relate to that. I mean, that was a little crazy, right? But you can relate to that you're not reflected in your society or you're rarely reflected. And we're gonna talk about, about some of the different uh, cultures that we study in this class, identities and all of that, and how exciting it is when you're finally reflected. It's pretty cool, right? So then again, like, okay, we're talking about kids' books. Come on, shut up. So am I dissing the very hungry caterpillar? Oh no, I'm not. There's all sorts of lovely, light-hearted books out there that make the grade. But there's a lot that don't, and there's a lot that we don't even realize don't until we look at it a little bit closer, that we do a little bit of deconstruction, right? <laughs> I don't know why. I just love that. Sorry. Roasted caterpillars. Couldn't resist. But so what we want to do is realize a couple of kind of dangerous things. Look at this. Children develop concepts of race and gender, and that means everything else, you know, ableism and, and homophobia and xenophobia and all those other isms that we're going to talk about, that they develop the idea of that, the stereotypes of that by around age five. Oh my gosh, that's so itty bitty, right? That is itty bitty. What are we going to do with that? Because sometimes when that happens, it's pretty hard to, to um, undo that, right? When you're hardwired. Age five, by the time... I mean, preschool is like, wow, you got to get them then if you don't before. Oof. So the thing is that if we reach them earlier in preschool ages and then some of these younger elementary school grades as well, all of that, how do we reach them? We reach them through, dang, we reach them through books, children's books, good children's stories that tell so many diverse stories that embrace so many different ideas, right? So I love this from... Um, a poet um, and a uh, writer of other stuff besides po poems, Annie Dillard, from a million years ago, way before you were around. But she talks about something that, that I just thought was interesting. She talks about uh, being fascinated with uh, the, the, the tale of Alice in Wonderland. And maybe some of you have seen the Disney movie or maybe you read the book, but so or heard some songs about it. Jefferson Airplane, five million years ago. One pill makes you smaller and the other makes you tall. That one. And anyway, so the, the deal with Alice in Wonderland is she eats things and she gets bigger or she gets smaller. It's like all this magic stuff. And so um, Andy Diller's thinking like she just was kind of horrified almost at the idea that um, that Alice, you know, she takes a bite of something and then she gets smaller and smaller. And so she's thinking, oh, my God, you could just like just shrink to nothing. Right. And she thought thought the idea of just like paring down, like just diminishing down to to almost nothing and you just slip into a little crack and you disappear, you know, that, that there's something really awful and scary, wretched and horrific, all those things. And, um, and, and what do we do about that? How do we, how do we just make sure that, that our fellow, um, folks or citizens or all of our kids, I'm talking about mostly that they don't feel invisible in the world. And again, I know that a lot of you, have felt invisible in your society, in, in your classroom, in, in your neighborhood, in your whatever, right? So what do we do? How do we, how do we stop some of this? Is we question the designated default? Is we question the ideal, idea of the dominant culture, beauty and, and the way to be, the way to be cool and all that. So we're gonna go into that. So here's what I feel like my job is um, as your uh, teacher. But first, I want to tell you about this book for a second, because this is kind of going long, but oh, well, sit back. 
<laughs> enjoy the ride or, you know, be annoyed. So this is such a cool book, I thought. I, so here's the thing is that I, we, I want us to kind of really learn how to look at stuff and decide if it's good or bad. And some of the stuff is so subtle that you think, yeah, there's no problem. And I fell into the, that with this book several years ago at the library, you know, because I got my little preschool and just feeling a little lazy, grabbing some books and look at this book. And I love it. So this is Miss Smith goes to whatever. So she's this cool teacher. I mean, look at Look how cool she is, right? She's got a leather, black leather jacket on. Hair sticking up, holla, right? And um, so she's the teacher. She has this magic book that when she opens it, they, all, they, um, all the, the classroom goes and does all this really cool stuff. So I thought, great premise, great looking teacher. Love the watercolor illustrations. Love all the, flip through the book. Don't look at the story too much. Flip through it. Oh, look at the the classroom. It's like, it's not just all white kids. It's all sorts of different kids. And, and, and you know, somebody with a disability, they'll go, bangs, ticking all my boxes, right? Get it back. Read it. Read it in my uh, little preschool circle without really going through it like should have. And the deal is, you're going to just think that I'm being silly here. But the deal is, what happens is Mrs. Smith gets pulled up by that pterodactyl right there into that pterodactyl's nest way up high and she's kicking and screaming. First of all, I'm a little ticked off about that because she looks so able-bodied, right? She looks tough. She got swagger. And no, she didn't because she's like, help me, help me. So help me, help me. Who do you think rescued her? So we're looking at this whole class. I'm just going to lead you here. You already probably know. We're looking at this whole class of some diversity. And who does she select to rescue her? Fill in the blank. Dominant culture, she selects the white boy. Now, don't get me wrong. Do, do we just shun white boys? Not at all. That's not what I'm saying. But the deal is that they get they get all the they get so much of the glory. And I'm looking at this book and I'm thinking it's really great, but I don't want that to be reproduced all the time. The idea that that's the rescuer. So do I get to use this book anymore? No, I don't. And sad, look how cute it is. I would kill for some of these illustrations. I'd frame them. I'd be looking at them right now. So in this class, what I want us to think about, or I want you to think about, because I think about it way too much, unfortunately, is like, is like, what do we do? How do we make sure that kids, you know, and ergo, you know, all of our population just doesn't, doesn't slip through the merest crack? How do we make sure that that people are represented and and really represented, not just tolerated, tolerance? F that, but in robustly celebrated, right? So whew, that's where we are. We're to say, let's look at these tales and make sure that these tales are accurate, that they're that they're really embracing and reflecting all aspects of our our society. Yeah, I think it's boom, big and important, right? Stories are important. So I like this quote. I can't remember. You might be looking at it. So literature in all sorts of ways, and it does for kids too. It kind of get it's like a, a, a roadmap. It tells you like how you should be in the world, what you should get, accept and not accept, what's appropriate, what's okay. And that's what we're going to be talking a lot about in here. So now you know that I love books, right? Oh, yeah, I do. Crazy about them. Crazy about children's books. So in here, let me tell you about this book, The Blue Nose Witch. Remember, I am, oh, you don't know, I'm old. I'm pretty old. I'm 70 years old. I turned 70 last October. So when I was around, when I was in school, when I was looking at children's books way back when, there weren't very many stories about girls who were doing cool things. And I mean, they're all going to be white girls at that point, but there weren't even any girls doing cool things. And I didn't even realize until years later why I love this book. I love this book because the main character was a girl and she was doing cool things. So she just wanted, wasn't in the sidelines. She was like a witch and she had like a little blue nose. So she had to powder. This is way before Bewitched, by the way, who does her little nose becomes a witch. And so she had to powder her nose. And so to just, you know, look regular every day. But then on Halloween, she could just witch it up. So I love that book. I loved it because it reflected more of me. You know, wanting something that was adventurous, or that was kind of sarcastic. It was like exciting. Who doesn't love Halloween? I love Halloween and I love witches. So those were all important things to me. And so I did what maybe a lot of you have done and maybe still do. And I have done 
throughout. I mean, that sounds all vague, but you know, when your role models are all something that you're not, then you kind of alter things a little bit, right? So I love this book, My Side of the Mountain. It was about this boy who was probably about 14, I think. And um, he he got to go live at his at his grandfather's land and in his on his grandfather's land for summer. He was like lived in upstate New York, and they said, "Yeah, you can do it." And I mean, you, he got found this falcon and trained it, and he lived inside of a tree, and he did all this cool stuff. And oh my gosh, I love that book because I hated my reality. I was in a kind of a crummy sort of living environment with. A stepmother, an evil stepmother who wasn't too crazy about me and all that kind of stuff. So this was as an escapist sort of thing for me, right? A chapter book, not a lot of pictures, but wow, in my head there were. But I mean, how much more would have it have resonated? I mean, it would have just been hit a home run if this happened to be a girl, something that I could be relate to more. And then you still know, fill in the blanks. If this happened to be a kid of color, if this happened to be somebody with a disability, if this happened to be um, LGBTQ, all those things fill in all of them and how much more it might resonate for a person that, that felt represented, that felt reflected. And, and if you think about it, if you think about it, think about a story that you loved as as a kid and why did you love it like if you grew up with books like what's one of the think about the book that you loved or if you didn't grow up with books in the household like the story that you love why did you why did you love it because perhaps there was some reflection for you or some escapism or something too right so the deal is there's a ton of great books out there now they're getting better and better and better all the time it's getting better all the time the beatles don't worry, I know newer stuff too. So so that part's kind of cool, right? Because it's getting better because we're finally figuring out that we need to do something beyond, beyond just representing, um, why did I do this? I don't know. Representing just the dominant culture narrative, right? So we're, and some of the stuff we think is good that doesn't represent, but some of it is bad. So we're going to look at all that. But so, oh my God, I'm getting tired. Are we done? One more? Is there another one? Should we try? Boom. Is that the last one? Oh, no. Okay. This is the last one. Boom. Okay, so there's great books out there. Oh, my gosh. So great. Jacqueline, Jacqueline Woodson, who is a beautiful writer. Rafael Lopez, one of the best illustrators ever. We're going to talk about that stuff. There's so many cool things out there, right? Just good things representing more than just our dominant culture. Like when we're talking, we're going to be talking about Amer um, American Indians and, and being more tribe specific. I mean, let's get in some of these heroes in terms of disability. I mean, let's talk about representation and bringing in culture, but not just only doing it around, you know, foods and festivals. So we're going to, oh, so many things. Really good stuff. Really good. Can't wait to share some, just some of the best things in the world, right? Ah, okay. So just pretty briefly, this is a writing intensive class. That's why you're here. That's why I've got you. And I don't mind. Um, I don't mind at all. I, I do not have a PhD. I have just my master's, which is enough for me right now. And so what happens is that, that people that are on the tenure track, we get these classes because they're kind of intense and, and um, same thing for your buck. So I don't mind. I love teaching this stuff. And so this is what you got to do in here. Two things, right? You got to write, and then the particular class has to do with what I just all talked about, the diversity and the uh, importance of, of uh, multicultural children's literature. So, But the deal is, there's so much writing, and, we, and we'll do it in different ways, but that's just like kind of a mandate. But I'll, I'll help you along the way, and a lot of it is um, reflective. A lot of it is reflective writing, and oh my gosh, you students write so many amazing things. I can share some of it with you. You'd like just what people have written in the past. Just stuff that will bring tears to your eyes. Well, maybe not your eyes, but mine. And it's not because I'm old. It's because I love this stuff. So we're going to do lots of writing, but we're going to do all sorts of other things that sometimes are trigger warnings for people. Sometimes are, it's political and divisive, but it's all here because it's part of what we got to do in this class. Is we're questioning the narratives, right? We're questioning the dominant culture. So it means sometimes a lot of sensitivity. And we need to be respectful of other people's beliefs. But it also can't stop us from talking about things that are directly connected to the idea that one dominant culture has set the rules and how that hasn't really been helpful for our, our society. Right? So 
this is um, all that's on your syllabus, just the objectives. So there's good ones, right? So I like this. When people cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read, or when the images they see are distorted, negative, or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are part of. That's what we're trying to do in here. We're trying to just kick that out the door, right? Disrupt that whole idea and make sure that we have ways that we can help people, kids, but other people that look at this stuff, see themselves in this world and, and feel like they can be part of this world in a really cool way, right? In a really cool way. So, so that is what this is all about. It's so a way back, you know, this is like one of the first elementary school books. Fun with Dick and Jane, right? So I'm saying like, kick out that idea, Fun with Dick and Jane. We got to get on to um, we just getting away from the dominant culture idea, right? Um, so how about Fun with Darius and Jada? Yeah, how about that? Or like, how about, how about just Fun with Jada? Right? So that's what we're going to do in here, right? We're going to. We're going to look at those single stories, right? So Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is that not that they are untrue, but that they're incomplete. They make one story and become the only story. So that's a TED Talk that's so cool that you will be looking at. And that's the end of my talk with you right now. There's Jupiter again way down at the end of the path. Thank you for listening. And and I hope that you enjoy slices or whole cakes that we're going to be eating up in this class. I don't know why I said that. Okay, I'll be talking to you soon.